fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Heard on FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren, of course, and Mr. Uh, David uh, Rose Martino <laughs> is back in the room <laughs> doing his karate. That's right. What's going on? What, what, what's What's... Why is Rose back? Well, I don't know. I was tired of Joe. <laughs> I see. Oh, yeah. The boxing boxing wasn't Joe. working. Yeah, no. boxer Joe no. wasn't working, and uh, no. we have to go back to Rose because it's it's sweeter. Yes. It's very That's mafioso. True. It's very yeah. uh, gang- Rose by any other name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not even going to touch that. <laughs> uh, speaking of roses, okay, mm-hmm. we're going to get into it. We've got a real rose with us today. Um We've got a an author, a publisher, a radio host. Uh, he's a dancer too, but by profession, um, Mr. Ron Chepsick. He's got a new book, "Bad Henry: Murderous Rampage of the Taco Bell Strangler." So, Ron, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alan. Good to be here. Well, well, Ron, um, you do a lot of things to do with the mafia and the gangs and all that stuff. So, how did you come across? Bad Henry and that uh, Taco Bell Strangler. It's a little bit out of my um, ex- usual expertise, because you, you're right, I write about the mafia and all this, and this is a serial killer. I never did a book before on the serial killer, and uh, this was a really big case in um, the news uh, back in the uh, 94 when they arrested him. And uh, in fact, it became the biggest prosecution ever in North Carolina and uh, follow the case, of course, because I live uh, on, a, on the uh, North Carolina border in um, a city called Rock Hill, which is like a suburb of Charlotte. And I, I followed the case and uh, I said, wow, this is really interesting. A black serial killer that was under the radar, uh, operated within a five mile area, killed 10 women. And they didn't really know anything about it until, uh, you know, he screwed up, you know, he was high on drugs and, uh, he started to make mistakes. And uh, I said, this would be a really uh, interesting book. And then I looked at the people that were chasing him. Like they had like Dateline and uh, CBS, 60 Minutes, all this. And, you know, I, I read in the newspaper, they're chasing him. And I said, wait a minute. I said, uh, someone's going to grab this. You know, somebody probably with more uh, credentials than I have. And I said, I don't know if it's worth it. So I let it go. And then um, about uh, year, about two years ago, I was... Um, thinking about my next book and uh, I was on the internet and uh, I ran across a reference to him and I said, Oh, Henry Wallace. I said, I remember him. So I, I said, I wonder what kind of book ended up being written about him. And uh, I went on Amazon, couldn't find anything. And I went on the internet and I found a lot, I found a lot of stuff, background stuff on, uh, on his case, but no book. And uh, so I concluded there was no book written on him and I couldn't believe it, you know, cause um, uh, he's one of the most unusual serial killers. Um, uh, they were saying that he was um, uh, the first serial killer that knew all of his victims. And uh, I found out because I had a woman on my show um, that, uh, that that's, she wrote a book called The Tuskegee uh, Strangler. And I don't know, she may have been on your show too, but she was on mine, Lisa Long. And uh, she had a guy, it was about a, a, a serial killer named Jerry Marcus. And he was actually the first. He was black too, but he was he was there before Wallace. He killed about six people. But it was still a you know fascinating case, and uh, and I couldn't believe that nobody would had done a book. And I said, "Well, I'll try my hand at serial killing." Oh yeah, yeah. writing. <laughs> and so, Glad you added that writing. Yeah. yeah. So I had uh, so I put together a book proposal and uh, and sent it off to Wild Blue, and on the same day they accepted it. <laughs> wow. So it was like yeah. it was it was not even the same day. It was like hours. You know, I, I sent it to my agent, and uh, she said. Uh, you know, you're not going to believe this, but the, they want they want to do the book. You know, they've already sent the contract, you know, and I, I was still in my chair. 
<laughs> yeah. I had just finished the letter. I mean, it was like it was like that. So yeah, I did that, and then um, I started to write the book and uh, did the research, and uh, I, I had a problem. No, nobody would talk to me. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, wow. the, the cops were embarrassed uh, because uh, I did a really uh, shoddy job of uh, investigating this murder, and they and they were highly criticized. It became racial because the black community thought that they. They had slacked on the job and and were and didn't really pursue this guy uh, until it was too late until until there were too many murders on that sort of thing. Yeah. And then the uh, the the relatives and associates of the victims that I identified, uh, a lot of them wouldn't wouldn't talk either because uh, they didn't want to talk about the case. Uh, they wanted to forget about it um, or uh, you know just decided that uh, it wasn't worth it. And uh, so it was a little difficult in that respect. But I did have a lot of um, information. I went down to the courthouse and uh, he had given 10 hours of interview when he was captured on, on March the 12th, 1994. And uh, they were amazing. They were really detailed, you know, where he just, he just let it all out. Right. And uh, he talked for like 10 hours. He went through every murder and all that and provided a lot of graphic detail on that. So I had that. Yeah. Yeah. On that, the court records were missing. I couldn't find the court records. Oh. But uh, I was able to to, uh, to get enough material, interesting material, interview enough people that I was able to put together uh, a book. And I, it took me about, from um, contract to uh, submitting the finished product, it took me about uh, uh, 10 months huh? to do it. Oh, well, that's not too bad. No, no. Why did the cop drop the ball, so to speak? Was it because... Uh, of his victims um, being, you know, black woman, or was it because of him being African American, or was it just the community, or what? What was the problem? It, it was a little bit of uh, it was a little bit of everything. Um, about nineteen ninety two, ninety three, ninety four, when these murders were uh, being committed, uh, Charlotte was really growing. It was becoming one of the, the fastest growing cities uh, in the country. And, uh, people were coming in like, like one year there, I think 92, 94 or something like 15,000 new jobs were created. And, uh, it was just growing by leaps and bounds. But unfortunately, the resources of the, of the, of the county and the city were not, you know, and, uh, in terms of, uh, of, of law enforcement, uh, they were trying to handle an increase in murders. Uh, that sort of jumped maybe three times what it was uh, before 92 to 94. And uh, they were trying to handle it with seven seven uh, investigative detectives, which is really amazing. And uh, so they were, they, and the murders were like probably about 119 murders a year. So you figure, you know, each detective was handling what, 13, 14, you know, 15 murders each a, uh, a year. And uh, so there was part of that. Uh, I think there's a little bit of... Um, Racial insensitivity. Let's put it that way. Uh, I think that uh, you know they sort of uh, wrote, wrote these girls off as uh, as lower economic um, uh, creatures and uh, didn't pay that much uh, attention uh, uh, to them. And then there was incompetence too. I mean, uh, these murders occurred within a five mile radius. Ten murders, and Wallace knew uh, every one of them. And for somehow they couldn't make the connection, you know, in their investigation until. He had he had gone through and uh, murdered uh, ten ten women, and uh, so it was all it was a combination of all. But it 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 uh, it was a, it was a black eye for law enforcement, and uh, it showed because uh, none of the cops wanted to talk to me except one, Jerry McFadden, uh, who uh, headed the investigation, and uh, uh, was actually quite competent, and uh, he was very honest in in discussing the case with me. But uh, he became my my key my key law enforcement guy on that. But none of the rank and file detectives wanted to talk to me. Well, I heard he wasn't you know the the usual serial killer um, that he didn't fit the the typical um, mo. Is, is that correct? Oh yeah, I mean he, uh, he you know he was, I interviewed one one um, one woman right here in town. Uh, she was from his hometown of Barnwell, and uh, she went to high school with him. And, uh, she, she couldn't believe that, that he was a serial killer. She said, I said, our Henry, you know, a serial killer. Uh, you know, he was black, but he ended up on the cheerleading squad and, uh, he ended up on the, the student council. Um, and he was, he was quite popular. He rode the school bus. And, uh, and when I told her the conditions that he lived in, 
um, you know, really squalid conditions. She couldn't believe it. You know, she could, none of that came out when, when he went to high school. And uh, so he was able to, uh, he had an affable personality and he knew how to talk to women. Uh, they trusted him. Uh, you know, he gave them advice and uh, they confided in him. And um, and he was able to uh, to use that to his advantage. And uh, but he was a really bad person. I mean, a really bad person. Uh, the way he killed some of these women was uh, is quite amazing. So, it, you know, you call it uh, Taco Bell Strangler. So what's the connection with Taco Bell? And well, many of the many of the victims and including Wallace worked at Taco Bell. You know, that's that's the connection, you know. And so, uh, you know, they wanted a quick, uh, quick, uh, catchy name and Taco Bell Strangler, you know, to identify him as the Taco. That's what the press identified him as, the Taco Bell Strangler. Well, yeah, it's just it's crazy. So he knew them all. Yeah. Or he knew. Yeah. He, and so do you, what was the reasoning behind his killing? Like, was he was he raping these victims? Was he attacking them in that way? Or was he? Uh, well, what was he out? He for? came. He, it. it he came from a really screwed up background. Um, he was, you know, he was born in Barnwell in 1995, November 4th, and his mother was brutal. Uh, she had a hard life. She worked in a textile factory and she used to beat him and her sister. Um, she used to call him everything dumb, stupid, just a constant abuse. Um, they lived in a, in a, a one room shack and, uh, he lived right, he uh, slept right next to the, uh, to the pots of uh, of crap that collected in the house, and he had to go out every morning and dump it out. And uh, she used to parade him uh, through the neighborhood in girls' clothes. And um, he had a he had a, a sister named Yvonne, and uh, she, she used to get uh, Lottie May was her name. That was the mother's name. She used to get them to uh, beat each other up, <laughs> uh, you know, when she was too tired to do that herself. So, you know, he had all of this abuse when he was growing up. And uh, the psychologist that um, that I talked to, um, you know, said that he, he got this incredible pent up rage against the opposite sex, you know, which eventually uh, accumulated and came out later on when uh, when he was uh, older. Yeah, you know, you know, Dave parades around in a dress too all the time. <laughs> Dave parades around in a dress, but he doesn't kill. Does he, he hasn't killed any females yet. Yeah, that we know of. Yeah. That we know of. I like North. I like Dave North he, Martino. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I see. That's a really good serial killer name. Yeah, your, hey, your show's confusing. He's yeah. Rose Martino. He's yeah. uh, North Martino. Well, he's North Martino's the serial killer name. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I'm the man of many names. Yeah, that just depends on what he's doing that day. Um, <laughs> what this is, so, what was his ammo? What did he do to these girls? He he um, he raped them and strangled them. Uh, he had a he had a hold he called the Boston choke, which was pretty sophisticated. And uh, he would come in the house and um, sort of uh, uh, take them into their confidence. They would turn around and he would strangle them. He would take them on and then. Uh, uh, he would t- take them into the bedroom and, um, you know, they'd be half dead already. And, uh, he'd end up raping them. And, uh, then he'd leave. The, the first victim may have been sexual. Uh, he, he said, he said in his confession that he was attracted to her, a, w- a woman named Carolyn Love. But the other ones, they were for various reasons. Uh, he had a really bad drug habit. You know, uh, late 1980s and, uh, early 90s were a period of crack cocaine and, um, and he he rode the trend. Uh, he he got into crack cocaine when he was in the Navy. And um, when he was uh, living in Charlotte, when he came there in 1992, uh, he started to uh, to do uh, drugs. Uh, he had already done alcohol. He he claims in one of his psychological reports that he 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 was drinking uh, 16 to 18 beers a day by the time he was uh, in his teens on that sort of stuff. And he had done marijuana and all that. And, uh, you know, he worked at Taco Bell, some of the other, the Black Eyed Peas, some of the other restaurants there, fast food restaurants, he was sort of a manager and a worker, but you don't make too much money then, right? So later on, uh, uh, he started to, to, uh, go after these women, uh, to get money. You know, he would, he would try to get money. Uh, one of them worked at, uh, worked as a, as a manager at the Bojangles, which is a chicken place, real popular here. And, uh, he knew she knew the combination. And, uh, he, uh, you know, he forced uh, her to give what he thought was the, was the combination. And, um, and it turned out to be, it was a combination. And, uh, he got money from that. And, uh, he, he stole, um, uh, 
ATM cards from a couple of women, but they, they gave him a false ATM number. And, uh, so that sort of really ticked him off. And, uh, he, he, uh, you know, he, he would, uh, watch the news because he thought that the police were going to catch on to him, right? And so he'd watch the news at night and nothing happened. There'd be no reporting on the news, you know, uh, he'd, he'd kill a victim and all that. And so he got really confident, uh, really confident. And, uh, as he progressed, he got reckless, uh, you know, and, uh, started to make mistakes. Um, uh, uh, he showed up, uh, on a ATM uh, camera, you know, with, uh, he had wore an earring and that identified him. He, uh, stole one of the cars of, uh, one of the victims, Betty Bauckham. And, uh, he, he would, ru- he would like, um, erase all the uh, evidence, right? Fingerprints and all that. And, uh, he forgot that he had closed the, the trunk to, of the car and had put his palm print on there. And that became later evidence for him on that sort of stuff. And, uh, so he, so as, as he progressed, he got more, more arrogant about the killings and more careless. And, uh, this led to a situation where <laughs> no matter how, uh, incompetently the police were, were reacting to the, uh, this crime wave, uh, they couldn't help but get onto him. Well, and if he's drinking 16 to 18 beers a day, I, amazing. He got the taco orders, correct? Yeah. Well, like, like I said, he was very, very smooth. Uh, I, I, uh, interviewed uh one guy that uh that smoked marijuana with him and and was was shocked that uh that he was a, a serial killer because he said like he gave no evidence of that he was very personable very personable guy did he get a formal uh psychological diagnosis yeah the, the several uh, psych, uh psychiatrists um uh evaluated him uh that became important in the trial because they were trying to get him off the death penalty the uh prosecutor marsha goodnow was uh, adamant about getting him on death row and uh the uh, uh defense were just as adamant about trying to get him off on a mental charge you know get him life in prison on that they did they didn't really contest the fact that he killed killed uh, these women but they just said that he was uh, mentally incapacitated and uh and uh, they thought that he didn't deserve the death penalty was he like a big strong guy or oh yeah yeah i could have called the book big henry Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. He was, uh, yeah. He looked, uh, you know, you know, Fat Albert. Yeah, <laughs> he looked a little bit like like him. Uh, although at one point in prison, he later went up to three hundred pounds. Wow, because uh, wow. of the diet, you know, and stress and all that. But uh, yeah, he was he was uh, quite a uh, you know a, a, a big guy, yeah. probably a little over six feet, uh, two hundred twenty pounds. And these women were all were small. Yeah. You know, they were, they were young. They're between 17 and 35 years. One was 35. Most of them were in their twenties. And, uh, of course they were no match for him once he put the Boston choke on him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he must have liked his tacos. <laughs> so, so, you know, how did they actually catch him? What was his mistake? Well, uh, the, is Gary McFadden, uh, the, the police were under pressure, uh, to do something about this. You know, the, the finally, you know, the, the they caught on that there was a crime wave in their neighborhood and it was probably a serial killer and all that sort of stuff. And, um, and so Gary McFadden became in charge and he was, um, he was competent. He was a sergeant, uh, for several years and, um, and knew what he was doing. And, um, uh, uh, what happened was, uh, he, he, uh, when one of the ladies were, uh, were killed, uh, he had a meeting and, uh, he called everybody and he said, uh, we're going to find out uh, uh, who, who's related to who in this case? I mean, who has a connection to who? And so they asked, uh, all the people that they, that they, uh, could find that were related to the case about, uh, you know, who knew, who knew who? And, uh, there's like, you know, all the, all the, uh, murders, only one name showed up and that was Henry Wallace, you know, and so, um, this started the, the, uh, the, the, uh, investigation off and they, they became concerned about uh, Henry Wallace. Uh, they had the, the palm print. Um, they, they had the, uh, the ATM, uh, photo, you know, of, of, of him using the ATM. They didn't have a clear photo of him. They had, but they had the earring and they, they, and they found out later that he wore it. He wore the earring. And then, um, uh, uh, they had a really backload, a backlog of, um, uh, of rape kits, right? You know, it was, and I just saw a show today on Law and Order where that was the whole basis that you had like a three year backlog or something 
incredible amount. But they had a a, a big backlog with the uh, Charlotte police, and um, and finally they got around to uh, some of these women, and um, uh, some of uh, Henry's uh, DNA showed up, and then um, uh, they found out that uh, a couple of months before his last murder, he had uh, shoplifted at uh, this mall, uh, had a thirty-eight dollar sweater that he stole. And so th- they started doing an investigation and they found out that, that, uh, you know, he was, uh, suspected of murder in Barnwell County before he came to Charlotte, um, and, uh, Allendale County, a nearby, uh, county to, uh, Bar- uh to Barnwell. And that, uh, he had, um, you know, a record in the, uh, in the military, the Navy that he had actually, he had left the mi- military on, on good terms, but there was something shady going on in the past. He, he had, uh, he had broken into a hardware store and got probation for that. And so they, he really became a suspect on that. And then um, they decided uh, uh, to pick him up, and they and they did. He was hiding in a friend's uh, bathroom, and they found him and um, and brought him in uh, for questioning. Was he married? Did he have a girlfriend? Did he have kids? Like- yeah, he had a girlfriend, which was uh, really weird because um, – Sadie McKnight was his girlfriend, and she lived with the, his first, uh, second victim in Charlotte, Carolyn Loud. Wow. Yeah, I mean, she was his, her roommate, and he actually went with them to file a missing persons report. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, her body disappeared. Uh, he dumped it on Statesville Road, um, and which is kind of a rural area, and um, they found it two years later. When, and the only reason they found it was because he confessed to it. To Carolyn Love's murder. Oh, on that sort of stuff. But yeah, but uh, and that was part of his downfall uh, was that she kicked him out of the house um, about a month before he was arrested because she was tired of his um, of his uh, crack cocaine habit, you yeah. know, and that he was he was into drugs and um, she was a pretty straight woman, pretty good woman, and uh, she kicked him out, and so that started him on a downward spiral on that, and uh, he got kicked out of his uh, uh, apartment. And he sold all of his, uh, he had some uh, weightlifting equipment in his house, and he sold all that. <clears throat> and um, a couple of his, of his associates saw him on the street, and he looked in pretty bad shape on that. And that, that's like I said, he started to make mistakes because he used to take really good good care of the crime scene. He would clean it up. You know, he would try to um, misrepresent, you know, what happened uh, by doing little things. And um, uh, he just got reckless. You know, he just, he started to... Uh, uh, for one thing, he killed three women yeah. uh, within the same apartment complex. Wow! You know, at the end, and so that that really set everything yeah, off. Convenient. Do you know what it was that set him off on a person? Like what made him choose his actual victims? Like I said, it was a part necessity. A lot of it was necessity. He needed money for for drugs. He was impulsive. You know, uh, uh, he decided uh, to kill someone before he went, uh, or, or when he was there, and then sometimes he would kill them. Um, uh, beforehand, you know, there's a couple of women that he killed because he already planned to kill them. He planned to steal their money and get their money and then, and then kill them. So, uh, there's very, a variety of reasons why he, um, why he killed, uh, uh, his victims on that. I don't think you could put it on any, any one, uh, one reason. Yeah. Okay. You didn't have like a particular urge or need. It wasn't all planned out and he wasn't trying to. No, 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 no. Like I said, a couple of the murders he did. He uh, actually went there and uh, with the intention of killing them, uh, stealing their money and um, and buying drugs with it. Wow. So now he got convicted of, let's say, nine counts of murder. Yeah. But you say later he's now he's admitted um, while in jail that he's done what? Anywhere from 20 to 90. Well, th- that's kind of controversial because I talked to McFadden about that and McFadden said that he always dangled that in front of him. You know, he said, well, if I, if I get a, I get a break on the sentence or you uh, reevaluate what, you know, you know, what you sentenced me to, uh, I may tell you where some of these uh, victims were. And uh, there's never been any evidence that he actually killed anybody else. You know, they were just sus- suspected it because he had traveled a lot in the Navy. You know, he, he, um, uh, was stationed out on, on the, on the West, in the West. And, uh, I never ran across anything, uh, you know, like this Kilgo, uh, murder, right? Right. Beach murder. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, the guy there that he's committed some crimes and they're looking for other places. In fact, right here in my, their county next to mine 
he, he suspected that he may have some some woman that he killed here on that, but there was no evidence that he ever did anything outside of the murders that he committed. You're strange. Now, so was he a particularly smart smart guy or real clever? And I, I saw his uh, psychological evaluation. Uh, he was average IQ, average IQ, and uh, he was um, he graduated from high school and he was smart enough to go to uh, a couple of colleges, you know. But he dropped out. I don't know why he dropped out, but uh, he did and ended up joining the Navy and working um, as a radio disc jockey. In, in Barnwell. And actually, he was pretty popular as a radio disc jockey. He had a good voice, and uh, the woman seemed to like him. Well, was he doing the true crime story? or <laughs> <laughs> No, he was doing music. <laughs> music. I mean, this is a disc jockey. Yeah. Like yeah. Wolfman Jack. <laughs> now you're dating yourself there. <laughs> what? Wolfman Jack? Well, I mean, I'm not yeah. dating myself. The story's dated. Well, I, the Wolfman Jack was story, probably story, dead by the nineteen nineties. Yeah, he was probably dead by then. <laughs> no, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. No. You what do you think, think so? Martino? Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking it up. <laughs> he's he's the guy that does that. He's he he's the 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 truth, the there. truth uh, sayer. Yeah. Nineteen ninety five, he died. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. See, at at fifty seven. Oh my. Wow. See, yeah. I told you, you're dating yourself. So he was dying when this guy was. No, the guy was big. Him. The guy was big. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, and that's uh, really strange. But you know what? I find it strange because you mentioned earlier how you know people were surprised. So he had there, there. He was a soft-spoken, gentle person, or something. So nobody had a clue. Nobody had any idea that he was rough or violent or went off uh, no i mean i told you uh he smoked marijuana with one guy uh, with one one of the one one, one uh, associated one of the victims the cousin of another one of brandy henderson uh he ended up watching the news uh and the, and the report of her murder and commiserating with <laughs> with george uh the the cousin and he was just a chameleon you know he, he just he, he really had people fooled you know, and uh, he was he was able to to manipulate people, gain their confidence. Like I said, the young woman, and of course, they were young, you know, they were early 20s, whatever. And, uh, you know, they didn't know this guy was a serial killer. I mean, God, you know, he, he would uh, he would take care of their kid and uh, give them advice and all that. And, you know, so why should they suspect uh, him of, of being a killer. So, so okay. So, what did he end up getting? Did he get sentenced to death, or how many how many life sentences? Yeah. What happened was uh, they went through the uh, trial, and um, and this was in the mid nineties, where the death penalty was still in vogue. Right? There wasn't that much sentiment against it, and he got the death penalty. And uh, everybody thought that he was going to be executed. Uh, I think the average uh, span of uh, conviction to execution was like nine years or something like that. And uh, he was convicted in ni- in 97. And then he, of course, he went through the appeals, right? And uh, uh, they were denied. And, and in 2005 was supposedly the last appeal he had. And it was denied. And the, and the conviction and everything stood up in court. And so, you know, you would think that there would have been a execution uh, soon after that maybe a couple of years at the most, but uh, nothing happened. And then the governor evidently uh, put a moratorium on the death sentence because it was, it was so controversial, right? For finding there that they were executing a lot of innocent people. And uh, so here he is on death row. He's been there for 27 years. And I asked uh, Gary McFadden, I said, uh, you know, uh, do you think uh, uh, Henry Wallace will ever be uh, executed? <laughs> His answer was, who knows? Oh, <laughs> just a, it's a big question mark. Well, they're pretty much not doing it right. much anymore, are they? Yeah. So he 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 knew about it as much as I did about it. Yeah. Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. yeah. Probably not. Yeah. And speaking of Wallace, um, I was I was going to uh, try to get an interview with him, but I talked to uh, uh, an ABC producer, you know, the the TV station ABC, who had done a a documentary on on. Um, on him and i asked her i said you know why wasn't wallace in there she said we tried to get him and uh he, he didn't want to be he didn't want he didn't want to be interviewed so i said to myself i said god i said it's gonna be a lot a lot of trouble going after him and i said if abc can't get him then why do you think he's going to talk to me and so i had most of my research and i concluded that uh 
uh, talking to him wouldn't add anything to the book outside of an ego trip. And so I, I, uh, decided not to, not, not to, uh, to go after him. He's in, uh, in central prison in, uh, in Raleigh. Um, yeah. Uh, North Carolina. Well, and I guess he'll, he'll never get out. There's, he has no chance of parole. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the, 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 uh, the relatives, you know, ha- have to deal with that. You know what I mean? And a lot of them, you know, want justice as they see it and they want him executed. So it's, um, you know, it's agonizing for, for a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. It, it becomes, it becomes too long. It's a long process. I mean, this is from the nineties. Yeah. So look at here we are in 2023 yeah. and it's still, still yeah. not resolved. Well, he was born in, um, in 65. Oh, so God. what? He's 58 yeah, years old. He's, he's still a young guy. I mean, he could, he could be in prison for another 20, yeah. 30, 40 years. Yeah. This is, it's, it's crazy. It doesn't, it doesn't really resolve anything for people. Yeah. You know, no end. Yeah. Wow. It's crazy. So, so what do you yeah. think at, at the end of the day, um, when this all happens and, and, it, and it kind of went down the way it did, did anything ever happen to the police? Did they reform anything? Yeah. Actually, uh, it, it did, ha- did have a reforming effect on the police. Uh, they started to get resources, especially technology about a year after because there were so, so many, um, uh, complaints, you know, and so much, uh, animosity. Uh, especially with the black community because of the way the case was handled. And so they started to get their resources. They, the police, I understand, have jumped from something like seven as it was back in 90, 94 when they arrest, when they were investigating uh, the Wallace case, uh, to like, uh, 25, uh, almost 30 now, uh, which is uh, good because it corresponds to their population increase. Uh, Charlotte has grown by leaps and bounds. It's one of the fastest growing cities in the country. Yeah. On that sort of stuff. Uh, but you still have, you know, problems, you know, with George Floyd and all mm-hmm. that. And, uh, I did some research and, uh, you know, there were, there were killings of black, of black, uh, young black guys, you know, uh, for, uh, what, what the black community thought was, uh, no good reason. And so the problems, you know, persist, but they're like any other city in America right now. Uh, but I think that, uh, that the police, um, resources, and approach to crime has has improved. Yeah, yeah, kind of crazy. So, w- was the trial yeah. like? Was it hard? I guess it wasn't hard to prove. Like it probably went pretty quick. Uh, not actually, it went two oh, years. Why was that? Yeah, they they, 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 they were fighting over uh, venue, oh. jury selection, right? And uh, you know, something like the Trump thing now that's going to happen. You know yeah, what I mean? something that lasts and, forever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's going to. Yeah, right. And so it went on for like like two years, and. Uh, and uh before the uh the, the verdict uh, came down right any of his family still alive or that they're all gone now uh his mother's dead and her sister's disappeared i tried to find her but i couldn't find her uh his girlfriend i think uh must have changed her name because i couldn't find any Sadie mcknight so yeah so uh it's it's quite a story so w- at the end of the day what do you think we've learned from this don't go to talk about <laughs> we'll go to Taco Bell, yeah. <laughs> Take tacos over yeah. burritos. <laughs> well, that's crazy. Well, so now, listen. Um, so, what else have you got coming out now? You've done this. This is out now. And um, well, I got the I got the TV series, and uh, we'll talk about my coming on talking about yeah. that. That's that's on Vix. It's a thirty part um, uh, TV series based on my book on Carlos Later, Crazy Charlie. Right. And, uh, I, I've seen it. It's, uh, it's really good. I'm really excited about it. And, uh, it's the first season, 15 episode has been released last January 20th. I mean, excuse me, July 20th. And, um, and then the next, uh, 15 episodes, I don't know when that's going to be released. It'll probably be maybe five or six months or so yeah. on that. Yeah. So I'm pretty excited. And I'm working on a book with, um, a producer, he, um, movie producer on this, um, a character from Dallas, Texas, uh, oil man. And, uh, it's quite interesting, uh, but challenging. And, uh, I'm working on that. We're hoping to turn, turn the book into a screenplay and, uh, um, yeah. maybe do a documentary as well and a podcast on, on it. Oh, so, busy man. Uh, I keep busy. Yeah. <laughs> What's the hardest thing about writing one of these books for you? I think, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, lining up the research. You know yeah. what I mean? Cause, that's one of the reasons why I like writing screenplays because uh, most of it is fiction. You know what I mean? Like maybe 10, 15% of the script is, is, is research, but 
you got to have your research. You got to have the documents if you're going to do the book, right? Mm -hmm. And people got to talk to you uh, if you're going to get really interesting stuff for your book. And and uh, I was a little worried on with this book because uh, a, a lot of the people that that I was hoping to talk to didn't. But fortunately, there was enough background material. You know what I'm talking yeah. about. There was enough background material that I was able to to uh, to put together uh, the book. Were the police real receptive on this kind of case? No. Or? No, because it was <laughs> no. They were they were absolutely you know they sort of really pissed yeah. me off on that. I'm so I'm so kind. Of, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to get even. <laughs> well, give us some names. We'll we'll go for them. Yeah, we'll we'll hunt that, them down. But uh, no, they 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 were like uh, you know I think they were embarrassed you know because of the uh, of the way they were they were um, um, highlighted you know because of the of the case the way they handled the case and right. all that. But uh, and I was worried about that because I thought I would have to talk to them. But I was able to get like Gary McFadden, who essentially oversaw the investigation, and he was he was really nice guy and and really helpful. And um, and uh, I was able to, uh, to to find material in the uh, in the backlog. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about people. Uh, how can people find Ron? Or have you social media website? Where 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 do they it bars? Not, where do they find you? Well, first of all, you got to know how to spell my name. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, but you can check me out at my website, uh, www.ronchepsik.com, C H E P E S I U K. Uh, that's my website. On that, I got a crime show uh, called Crime Beat uh, with Ron Chepsik, and it's at uh, artistfirst.com. That's artistfirst.com. And uh, you can check my books out uh, going to Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, and um, you can, um, uh, you know. Check with your local bookstore if you want to go that way, and and, uh, and some of them should carry it. If not, you can order. And uh, I'm on Facebook, and um, I don't tweet. Oh. And uh, <laughs> you say you're asking if I dance. I don't dance on TikTok. No, come on. <laughs> come on. What do you got to lose at this point? Come on. Right? <laughs> well, I got to practice yeah. first on that. But I'm not I'm not on Instagram yet. I'm I'm trying to figure out how to get Instagram's on there. Instagram's good. Yeah. And on that. So but you can you check me out on Facebook. Yeah, Facebook. On that. And if you uh I get a lot of requests and I don't know if they're quacks or frauds or whatever. So uh just put uh in your message that uh that uh, uh you read one of my books or that uh you you heard me on one of the radio broadcasts. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have everything up on our website so they can find you. Uh, I'll put your phone number up there too. How's that? Oh no, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> oh come on, yeah. a little bit of fun. You never know. Yeah. Hey, you're coming on my show. Let's let's talk about oh, that. Yeah, yeah. I get around. I'm, you know. Yeah. You're coming on what? Uh, it's all a blur. It's another week? week or so. Yeah, it's not very far. Yeah, a yeah. week, right? You're you're coming That's on week. on Thursday. What would that be? That would be the tenth. Yes. Yeah. August the 10th, right. I'm going to talk. So will, will this show be posted before then? Yes, it will. It'll be up on the same day, actually, live. Oh, you know? wow. And, okay. and we'll be talking Bad Henry on your show about me. Yeah, on that then. Well, okay, that yeah, sounds, that we sounds appreciate good. it. Okay, our guest, uh, his new book's called Bad Henry, and it's the murderous rampage of the Taco Bell Strangler. And our guest, of course, is the author of that, Ron Chepsik. Sam, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This is a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.